Okay, good morning and welcome everybody to BC314. It's our second lecture this week on uh, media and technology. Hope everyone's doing fine, everyone's doing good. Let's take a moment to pray before we get into uh, talking about digital equipment today. We'll talk a little bit about software and a few things about hardware that's used. Um, could somebody please pray with the class and we'll start. Anyone could pray. Can I pray, Pastor? Yep, go ahead, Asha. Dear God, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. Thank you for this day, and thank you for all my classmates and Pastor God. Lord, as we're about to learn about the digital equipment, Lord, that we may understand what it is to know the digital stuff, God. Lord, yeah, thank you, God, for uh, this time where we learn, where we um, interact and know what it is and understand everything you have for us to understand, God. Lord, we pray your spirit lead us and guide us. Thank you so much for me. We pray. Amen. Okay, good morning, everyone. So today, um, today and maybe we'll take... Uh, maybe one or two more lectures, I'm not sure. Um, we will go over digital equipment, a little bit about software side of things, and then of um, the physical equipment, um, mainly from, a, from the perspective of uh, graphics, audio, video production, live streaming. Uh, now, uh, as I said yes, yesterday, uh, the, this goal is not to train us how to use all of this. Obviously, that we cannot do, uh, you know, in in, in a very short time. Uh, some of the students who are here, they get to do it during our Sunday services and and other occasions. And in fact, some of them have become very good. Some of our students in the who, um, um were studying with us, were serving with the media team, then eventually became part of the media team. They joined us as staff. So that happens, you know, for the students who are here physically uh, and when they get involved in those those areas. But the purpose or the intent uh, in going over this lesson on digital equipment is just to give us an exposure, right? Um, the goal is for us to have enough information so that when you are interacting with your teams, uh, you know, you may have a graphics team, you may have a, a video production team, you may have uh, people who you may even uh, hire vendors to do this for you on special occasions and so on. Um, so you will just know at least how to communicate with them, understand what you're saying, make decisions and so on. So from that perspective, I'm sharing this information because uh, uh, personally, uh, I had to make this journey. Right, so I thought, okay, I'll be a pastor, and uh, you know, I, I want to minister and teach the word of God. True, that's 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 good, but then you soon realize that uh, you've got to deal with all these other things about um, audio equipment, media themes, and they are coming to you and asking you for you know information and guidance and so on. And if you don't understand what they're doing, uh, you know, it's very hard to make decisions. So it was a learning process for me also. And I'm continuing to learn. I just, you know, I, tried, I tell them, hey, please tell me, what are you doing? Well, um, uh, the people are doing the video production, the live stream. And of course, I go up online and read uh, so that I understand. So from that perspective, just to give us enough information, uh, this, you know, some of you may be in uh, uh, places of leadership or you may have to make some of these decisions. So. Uh, at least you have a little bit of a background, okay? So that's the intent. I'm not here to kind of train you on these things. I'm not an expert myself, but uh, at least uh, we'll have some information to work with our people. So when you talk about digital equip equipment, we are referring to both the software and the hardware that we need for media work, 
right? So graphics software, and uh, uh, th th there are several uh, software packages that are generally used. Um, uh, Adobe Cloud, Creative Cloud is um, something that's very commonly used, very popular. And uh, if you are a registered nonprofit, you can get a discount. As well, if somebody in within the organization uh, submits a little application for you, and uh, you get a discount, so I'd encourage you, encourage uh, you to tap into that if if possible. Uh, that's something we've been doing for a number of years now, and uh, so we we kind of benefit from that. And all our media team people uh, have access to it. They get they do their work uh, using the Creative Cloud. So. Uh, of course, there are also uh, free free web applications for graphic software that you can tap into, and I've just mentioned a few of these, uh, and I'm sure there are several more web-based. Now, now, a lot of these are web-based, cloud-based, so you don't need necessarily to install anything on your machine. Just set up an account, and you can do it very easily. So you can explore using free applications as well. Um, on the video editing side, again, you've got commercial as well as free uh, video editing software. I've um, listed several here. Uh, we use uh, Adobe uh, Premiere Pro for our video editing work. Uh, of course, there are a lot of other commercial versions available, as well as there are free editing um, software, video editing software that are, that are available. And it's good to I mean, uh, either if you are interested in it, and of course, or your, your teams are interested in it, you let them pick one that they are comfortable working with. And uh, there are definitely a lot of uh, tutorials, video tutorials that they can train themselves and uh, do well. Now, when it comes to uh, video, video editing, it's good to have some sort of understanding of it because, you know, a, you as a you know as as a communicator so you may be a pastor you may be an evangelist you may be a preacher but you are the communicator you're the one who is delivering the content uh, your media team or your vendor that you have hired who's going to come and do the video recording and edit editing they know the tools but they don't know what you want to get across Right, so for you, it's 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 important that uh, you understand a little bit about what can happen, what cannot happen. So you tell them, hey, I want it like this, or this is what I'd like to, how I would like it to be done, you know, so that you communicate that to the people who are going to edit your video, so that what you want to get across to the people is actually what will be put across. If you just let them do it. They will do whatever they think is in their minds, uh, which may not be what you want to get across to the people, right? So to that extent, you need to influence, uh, you need to speak into the work that is being done, uh, even in the video editing, right? So it's not your micromanaging, but you're being careful of what you what is getting across to the people. Otherwise, if you let them on their own, they'll do just random, all kinds of things which may not be what you want to get across to the people. So, you know, just even as recently as uh, a couple of weeks back, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've been doing this video editing and all of that for a long time, but a couple of weeks back, one of our graphics people uh, decided to change uh, the, what we call as thumbnails, the cover graphics for our videos. And they started, you know, uh, I'm just saying this example, this is a small example, to, to say that, you know, you need to be watchful of what people are doing, your, what your media team is doing. So for whatever reason, this person decided that uh, they're going to put, uh, for our Sunday sermon videos, they're going to put the, you know, the, the pictures of uh, the preacher on the video, on the thumbnail graphic. Now, Right from the very beginning, uh, and this is just a this is just a personal and an organizational decision, right? Other organizations dis would work differently. I'm just speaking from a personal and an organizational 
perspective. From the very beginning, we said we don't want people's images to be put out uh, simply because we, we want to downplay, as far as possible, we want to downplay um, uh, or focus on the preacher or the pastor. Uh, let it be the content which is a draw to the for people to come and use the resource rather than the, the, the picture of the preacher. So that was a, just a guiding principle right from the beginning. Uh, one change we made along the journey was, okay, for the daily devotional, okay, just for the daily devotional videos, it's okay. You can put the picture of the person speaking so that, uh, because it, it changes week on week and it's kind of helpful to, for the audience to know who's speaking from that perspective, but don't change it for anything else. We don't want people's pictures to appear on any, any other graphics. That was the only exception we made. Because our our the motivation was let's not put the focus on the speaker. Let's keep the content as the main reason why somebody should come and watch the video. Then suddenly, you know, this change was made. And uh, when I I let it go one Sunday, but then one or yeah, one Sunday. Then later on I saw this thing and I said, oh, oh this is not what we want to do. And then I had to give feedback. And this happened recently, just maybe about a month ago or so. So I give feedback. I say, guys, look, uh, this change is not good. Let's stay with what we originally designed, had in mind. You know, keep the people off the cover graphics, the thumbnails. Just put the sermon title. Keep it that way. Now, it's a very small thing, but it is an important thing from for us. Meaning, we always want to keep people out of the way, and let the content speak for itself. And we want to keep it like that. So uh, I, I'm just mentioning this because you as a leader, as a pastor of the ministry, you decide. And you need to be able to speak to your media team. People tell them, hey, this is what should be done. This should not be done. They understand everything, but you are saying it. So some, similarly, when you get into the details of the video production, uh, you should be able to you know, um, communicate your thoughts and your ideas. So, um, uh, here are some things that that will be useful to know. Uh, one is about multi-track editing and multi-cam editing. That means you can have different cameras coming in on, on the shoot, on your subject. If you are preaching from the stage or if you're speaking into the camera, you can have multiple cameras coming in. And then at the time of editing, they can you know, edit what's happening, right? They can show different angles. And that's good for you to know because sometimes you can tell them, hey, don't shoot from these angles in the in the in the auditorium. Don't do, you know, there are certain things we don't want. It might disturb the people, or we don't want people to become to come up on the screens. They become very self-conscious and all uh, on that. So because you know that, you can tell them, don't do these things, keep it like this. Okay. Um, other things you can do with video editing is motion tracking, which is we can zoom in on a particular object. Uh, in, in your video, uh, and you can track that object through the video. So uh, uh, if you want to blur over somebody's face, you don't want to reveal their identity, or you want a text box displayed throughout, you know, so, um, throughout a particular object during the video, you can ask for those kinds of things to be done. Um, you can color grade. Uh, that means you can change the whole color scheme or the color grading of the video. So sometimes you might say, hey, uh, uh, you know, uh, usually I let these kinds of decisions be made by the video editor. I'm not directly involved, but sometimes, uh, you know, I might, because you know it can be done, you can ask for it to be done. That, uh, hey, change the color grade and make it look a little brighter. Maybe it, you know, it can enhance the mood of the uh, entire video that's being produced. And of course, uh, there are special effects. You can create some animations, transitions, and so on. So, for example, when we were under lockdown, uh, you know, uh, during during the COVID pandemic time, uh, we were under lockdown, and so you know, the the Sunday sermons were being pre-recorded. Uh, they're actually being pre-recorded in 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 our uh, in in an apartment, uh, and uh, you know, just using one standing camera. Uh, and uh, so that recorded, pre-recorded video would be uh, released on Sunday. So how can you make that recording a little bit more 
engaging for people that you can ask them, hey, okay, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm pre-recording this video um, and I'm, you know, we upload it, we send it off to the media team. Okay, guys, when you're editing it, make it a little interesting, you know, and so I, I, we did request that during during those days, say, hey, you know, show the scriptures coming in, show some graphics coming in, or maybe even you know, do some things to, because it's a very kind of quote unquote dull recording, you know, I'm just standing in front of the camera and recording the Sunday sermon. And uh, we had to do that during the pandemic. But you know that during the editing process, some of these things can be done. So you specify and say, hey, uh, while I'm talking about this, do this. While I'm talking about this, please do this. Uh, please show this picture. Please show this video in between, etc." And you can ask for the special effects just to make that video a little bit more engaging. And so uh, you can ask for those things. Um, you can. Uh, work on the action. You can speed things up, slow things down, uh, and, and reverse what can be done. Uh, video editor rendering. So basically, once they finish the video work, they have to render it. That means they have to put the video into a format that can be then released. So that rendering takes a lot of time. So um, you know, when you are planning for things, you need to keep that in mind uh, because if it's if the longer the longer the video uh the and the the greater the resolution of the video of course the rendering will take a longer time so keep that in mind as you are planning something so say so okay uh, i'm going to record it and I, I need this thing to be released tomorrow well you know suppose whatever you're recording is certain high quality and it takes a couple of hours to render some of these high quality videos uh, will take hours to render uh, you need to factor that in as you plan, right? So don't just think that, okay, they video, they'll edit, and they can, you know, release it. No, they, vi they, they record the video, they edit it, and then, then they have to render it. And depending on how long your video is, that rendering itself can take sometimes a couple of hours. Just keep that in mind. And um, uh, just a small thought here about, you know, if you're doing using your phone, uh, you can use various uh, video editing apps that are on the phone to work with your video. Okay, so there's just a little introduction here on on uh, video editing software. One more thought, and I'll pause for some questions. Um, it's about desktop publishing. So when you are creating uh, maybe books, graphic uh, brochures, magazines, newspapers things that are going either for print or for digital editions, ebooks, um, you will typically use what, what we call as desktop publishing software. Um, something all of us are very familiar with, of course, is Microsoft Word, which can be used as well. And uh, But then as you uh, want to do a little bit more complicated stuff, uh, more, uh, you know, more control things, uh, we, our, our team works with uh, InDesign, uh, and so, um, and also our printers, they work with InDesign. So, um, for example, the books that we physically print, I, I would send the content as a Microsoft Word document to our uh, uh, publications team. They would do all the, you know, the proofreading, all of that, and then they send it off to the printers, and the printer then typesets the page in, uh, Adobe InDesign, so they would the final layout with all the, whatever needs to be done, formatting everything is done by the printer in InDesign. Uh, so the person who does it, you we usually refer to him as the desktop publisher, does it, and then they send back the proof for us to look at uh, a PDF document. We look at it, yeah, everything is fine. Then when we give the go ahead, then they go ahead and print the books. So. That's just something for us to be aware of, um, and uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, that's about what I wanted to share. Yeah. So this is all. This is another interesting part when if you're printing things or getting things ready to be printed. As far as uh, media presentation, so uh, uh, this is something we use when we are presenting inside, you know, auditorium uh, when we're uh, putting things up on the screen during a service or a presentation. Typically, you use this for uh, showing your song lyrics, 
your uh, scripture verses, your um, sermon slides, so on. So there are church, there is church presentation software. Now there are commercial versions. When we started, uh, you know, uh, uh, several several years ago, we started out using Easy Worship. Uh, that was, you know, uh, simple for us and sufficient for us at that time. Uh, then we moved to uh, Pro Presenter, which is what we are using now. Uh, so we use this to, you know, show the lyrics of the music, uh, the worship lyrics, along with various backgrounds. It helps you change all of that, makes it look nice when it comes up on the screen. Uh, then we also can show scripture verses, and we also bring in our um, sermon points. As, as the sermon is going, the sermon slides come in. Uh, and then now we also are doing live streaming. So we have something that comes up in-house for those inside the auditorium and something that comes up on the video that goes on the live stream. So all of that, uh, we work with ProPresenter. And there is a free open ver source version as well that you could use uh, in case you don't want to use a licensed version. Okay, let me pause here before I get into the camera stuff camera side of things. Um, are you, uh, is everyone with me so far? Say, go ahead. Yes, Pastor, I was just going to ask, um, uh, pertaining um, someone slides, uh, in, in your course of uh, experience and years pastoring, what has been, or what would you advise um, preachers not to do when it comes to preaching the word and then having their slides um, projected. Um, I know there's a danger of getting people distracted or getting their attention away from what you're saying on or an over dependence on the slides uh, versus speaking heart to heart. So I don't know if you could just speak to that to help us, you know, um, so that we don't fall um, into a situation whereby um, um, there's so much emphasis on the slides, which is good, um, versus we speaking from our hearts and trying to create that picture in the minds of people um, based on the words we're speaking. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, good question. I'm glad you asked that. So I'll just share my experience. I'm not saying uh, my experience is universal or everybody will agree with me. Uh, I'm just speaking, uh, you know, my experience. Um, uh, so, you know, there are two things that uh, I personally I wanted to achieve. One was, uh, one is we, we understand the impact um, or, or you know, of uh, people hearing and seeing, right? So, uh, uh, so if you do have some supporting slides coming in while you are speaking, it definitely has an impact on the audience. So that's a good thing. But there are some downsides also. Uh, one big downside that I have not been able to resolve, of course, is that because people know that things are coming up online, they have stopped opening up their Bibles and they have stopped taking notes. You know, so this is, I feel a little sad about it because for me, I love to see people opening the Bible or I love to open my Bible myself. And secondly, uh, it's a good thing to take notes when you're listening, right? Uh, like there's an old, old saying, a blunt pencil is better than a sharp mind because our minds you know can only retain so much on the first hearing but even if you write down with a blunt pencil you can you know go back and refer to it but anyway so that's been a downside i i i i don't know how to resolve it but but anyway from from my personal you know the personal thought thought process was uh, yes, let's you know when 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 all of these presentations, software, and all of that became available for us. Uh, of course, it's been a long time now, but I said I said let's use it. There's nothing wrong in using it because it actually will 
enhance our communication. So in addition to listening, people can see, uh, you know, you can reinforce a point or whatever you're showing, you, it can help reinforce your communication. So that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Uh, so we, we decided to use it. But then there was the challenge where of how can we, one, it shouldn't look like a presentation. It should be a message that's being brought as opposed to, you know, um, like, a, uh, like we have um, a, a, a typical presentation, you know, slide after slide that uh, it, it shouldn't be that way. And second is the point that you brought up is how can we have freedom that uh, if I feel like going off in a certain direction to emphasize a certain point, which may not be on, on the slides, how can we have the freedom to do it? So here's how, uh, you know, I'm just, again, speaking my own personal experience, how we reconciled it. So from the beginning, we when we started using slide, uh, the PowerPoint uh, slides and all of that for as part of the sermon, I chose not to pay attention to the slides, meaning I know the slides are there. I have my notes with me. But I'm going to speak as though I have always been, you know, as I've always been speaking, which is uh, deliver the message. I told the PowerPoint, the person handling the presentation, I said, you follow me. That means you pay attention to what I'm saying and you change the slides accordingly. I am not going to pay attention to the slides. So that was from the very beginning. We, we started off like that. So I said, hey, you just follow me. I don't even have a controller for the for the presentation. I don't use it. I just I have my sermon notes for my, my for me, and I just speak and let the person who is in charge of the presentation just follow me. So that way I, I, I'm I'm a little I, I'm free, right? I'm not being controlled by the PowerPoint. I don't have to pause and tell the person next slide. I, I don't have to do it. I, I can just just flow, okay? just flow, just deliver the message as I had originally planned. So that was something we started doing in the very beginning. So our presentation people, all the people who serve in the media team who are going to be responsible for the presentation, that is the projection of the sermon notes, uh, sermon slides, they are trained to do this. That means they have to follow the preacher. Uh, because I'm not going to stop and say next slide, nothing. I'm just going to flow. They have to keep pay attention, keep following. That's one thing. Um, now there are times when I f when I may glance at the monitor and I see that they're not following me, then I correct them. You know, and this is sad because I have to correct them publicly and say, hey. Please move, you know, please move, <laughs> move ahead and move back. That happens rarely. Uh, I, I, I generally don't do it, but if I glance at the monitor and I see that they're not where uh, on the same slide as what I'm speaking on, then I just please, please move forward. Uh, but otherwise I don't, I, I don't, you know, I don't uh, interact with them. I just like to flow. The second is, if I need to say something that is not part of my notes, it's not part of the slides, but I feel that we need to go there and you know speak about it, I take the liberty to do it, and that all our pastors you know are free to do it. Okay, yes, it's not. It wasn't in our sermon notes. It wasn't in the slides. But you feel that you need to, you know, talk about it and address it. The Holy Spirit is moving in that. Go, go for it. Doesn't matter. And again, here, our media team is trained to do it. They know that I'm off the slide, uh, and so I might even tell them. I said I might just say, hey, okay, this is not in the slide, so just follow me. So what they will do is then they will project the scripture uh, onto the screen, which I may be referring to. Uh, even though it's not on the slide. So they, there is freedom to move, and the media team follows along. So uh, this is how we've struck, 
we've set ourselves up so that uh, one we're able to flow freely and two if we need to flow into something which was not there before we can do it and the media team will follow I hope that helps that that helps thank, thank you, you pastor uh, thank you right so just to give you a little uh, insight into what happens on a weekly basis now you know in order to prepare um, the slide presentations the media team of course uh, you know needs time so what I do is uh, at the beginning of the month uh, okay so in the beginning of the year we uh, I prepare you know just a general idea of all the 52 Sundays this is what the sermons are going to be uh, I share, share it with our pastors and the media team so they have an idea that okay these are the sermon topics for the year of course we can change it it's it's not set in stone, but they have an idea so they can start thinking about their graphics and what they want to do and all of that. Then on a monthly basis, towards the end of the month, I send them the topics for the, the sermon topics for the coming months. For example, today uh, I sent them the sermon topics for the month of what's April, uh, and I made some changes from what I had sent them at the end of last year said okay three sun three sundays i'm changing the topics it's on the same theme but i'm changing this topic title so there is that freedom to do it so they will work with that so i sent it to them today for the month of april they can start preparing the graphics and all of that then each week usually by the wednesday of the week so this happened yeah wednesday of the week i have to send to our media team uh, what we simply call it as the text the text for the presentation and the lower third so uh, i send them the text say so this is what i we are going to have in the powerpoint so i have to send that by the wednesday so the sermon has to be ready uh, or at least the main points i have to get it ready and by the wednesday of the week I have to send it to the media team now sometimes i i slip up meaning I, I need a little bit more time so i might send it on a friday thursday on some really rare occasions hopefully i send it on a friday but generally i try to send it by wednesday that these this 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 contains the main points of the ser of the sermon and the scripture text that need to come up right so what happens uh, the media team they prepare the powerpoint and they also prepare graphics for the lower third. The lower third goes on the video. Uh, and, um, and the PowerPoint is used at uh, all our other locations. So, you know, that same sermon is going to be preached at all six locations. So uh, only one location is, you know, is on live stream, but all the other five locations, they have in-house presentations happening. So the PowerPoint is used at all those like locations five locations uh, and in the the central location that goes on live stream they prep, they use the lower third but the content for that is sent by Wednesday so the media team will prepare that and they will send it out to uh, the we, we refer to them as the media presentation team that is the team that's responsible for projecting uh, by usually by Friday or Friday they'll send it out so they already have everything ready um, then of course I, I I can always prepare my sermon they add the meat to the bones you know add, uh, all that I can do uh, but it's following that outline which I've already sent uh, to them so I can add scriptures I can add anything else to the sermon um, and, and so then when we are delivering the sermon on Sunday it's like as I explained, we follow the follow the same thing, uh, the sermon that we've prepared. The person uh, doing the projection will follow us as we're going. Now, on some rare occasions, I will tell the team no presentation, which I did. You know. Um, on the last Sunday of January this year, 
I told the team, hey, everybody, you know, you guys can have a break. No need PowerPoint today. No, 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 no need presentation during the sermon. I'm just going to preach. So that was one particular Sunday when when I intentionally just said no presentation. I'm just preaching, and it was a simple sermon. Uh, it was a sermon on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So uh, I just told the media team, hey, no need to project anything. Just keep the sermon title throughout, uh, because the the purpose is just to. Uh, share about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and get and then pray for the people en mass to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So that particular Sunday, nobody prepared any uh, PowerPoint, no slides, nothing, because it was just going to be free flow. And we planned for that and let it happen. Okay. Any other questions on this whole presentation aspect? Okay. Uh, I hope this information is useful and hope I'm not boring you, uh, just to let you know what actually happens uh, behind the scenes. Okay. All right, let's go back to where we paused. What was it? Oh, yeah, okay. So now, uh, sorry, that was the end of, um, you know, what we do in terms of software presentation. Now I'll just quickly uh, try to talk a little bit about, we have... Uh, yeah, I think we have enough time. Uh, camera and photography. So, again, uh, you know, I'm personally I'm not an expert in this. I don't, you know, do this myself. Uh, there are people who do it, and maybe some of you in the class are great photographers, and so you probably know a lot more. But I uh, put this information together just so that. Uh, we understand certain things because sometimes, you know, uh, in my own experience when I'm working with our media team, they'll say, you know, I want to buy this kind of a camera. <laughs> like, what is that camera? Oh, and uh, then they will tell me, you know, oh, this camera is better than that camera because of this reason or uh, et cetera, et cetera. Then I, I had to, like, understand what they're saying uh, in order to say, like, okay, does it make sense? Uh, do we really need to buy that kind of a camera? All of that, those things, you know. So from th that perspective, or sometimes when they say, "Oh, we have a problem. There wasn't enough lighting, or this and that," then at least I understand. I can, you know, empathize and understand why things didn't work out. So I'm speaking from that perspective. I'm not myself, you know, a great photographer or something. And, and you don't need to be, but it's just for you to, you know, make those decisions as a pastor, leader. Right. So basically, you know, nowadays you can use your smartphone, your basic smartphone to take pretty decent for photographs and um, uh, the settings that are typically recommended. If you can if you can do this, uh, 1920 by 1080 pixels, 30 frames per second. If you want to do a recording with your phone or uh, for photography with your phone, you ensure good lighting. Uh, if you're doing a video recording, just make sure there's no background noise. Uh, now, there are a lot of things that go into getting good quality photos uh, when you're using uh, your cameras and some other things that you think about when you're considering buying cameras. You know, how easy it is to use, uh, the weight and the size, the ergonomics, uh, what are the, you control in the settings, and can you grow the camera? Meaning, uh, if you buy a camera, so I, I ask these people these questions. You know, okay, you're buying a camera. How how many years can we use it for? Because it's very expensive. Uh, how many years can you use it for? Can you add lens to it? Because that's a very important part of it, right? So, uh, would you would we be able to you know extend it uh, by changing the lens or you know things like that? And of course, price is also important. So if you know these things, you can ask them. You know. You know, before you make a decision to buy a camera, you look at all of these things and say, hey, you know, how easy is it is it to use? And if you're using it for outdoor or you're taking it uh, for on travel for events outside your your location, is it something that's doable? Things like that. So generally, uh, your smartphone cameras are pretty decent. You can it's very easy to use. Uh, you can, of course, use it anywhere, anytime. Uh, but it may not necessarily be the kind of quality you want. Uh, images may not always be there for you to use in uh, further use, like if you want to use them on videos or use them on 
print graphics and so on may not be there so that's where you then decide to you know go go one level up uh, to buy cameras and then when you're buying cameras of course there are different kinds of cameras there are the basic level point and shoot cameras small little ones just point and shoot uh, again there are little this may be sometimes now the smartphone cameras are almost on par with these point and shoot cameras uh, and uh, but you know they, they, they bring in some additional benefit you can have control over certain settings like your shutter speed and your aperture and the uh, the amount of light you let come in which of course you, you can't do with your smartphone camera and then you have the higher ends coming in which are uh, mirrorless cameras and your DSLRs so at the top of the range you know on the higher side you, you know, it's okay, I want to buy a DSLR camera. I'm going to get good pictures. I can do a lot with that and so on. Or you, if you don't want to spend as much, slightly less mirrorless cameras. They are much more easy to carry. They're not bulky. They're not, they don't have, you know, they don't need too many accessories. And uh, you can take them around with you easily. Uh, and uh, they are, they are pretty good in terms of giving you the kinds of images for what you want to use. So mirrorless, mirrorless cameras are more compact, more easy to use, and so on. And uh, you can think about that. So typically, when you're consider considering buying a good camera for your church or your ministry, it's most likely you have to make a decision between buying a mirrorless camera or a DSLR camera. And again, a lot of fact, couple of factors you take into account: how much you're willing to spend, uh, what is the long-term use, um, are you going to be carrying it around a lot, uh, etc. So you think about these uh, factors. Um, some other things that generally, again, this is not necessarily something you need to remember, uh, but just for you to know uh, that. Uh, you know, when you're using it in manual mode, you have full control of over the settings, as opposed to just leaving it in auto mode. Your aperture is determines how much of light you're going to be letting in through your into your camera to fall on the sensor. So you can play with the aperture. You can play with the shutter speed. So uh, you know, if you uh, want to let more light in you can have a slower shutter speed more light hits the sensor image becomes a little brighter but if the ambient light is already pretty good you want to you don't want that much light coming in so you minimize your shutter speed you also minimize your aperture um, and then uh, also if you're shooting uh, shooting in darker conditions without a flash and you you know you want to uh, if you have a more sensitive camera, you could, you know, it's going to uh, stand you good in that situation. So, if you're going to be shooting in those kinds of conditions, uh, you want a camera with a better ISO for if you're going to be doing it there. But if you're mostly doing it in house where you have full control on the light, you don't necessarily have to have higher uh, ISO and sensitivity. So, these are small things to keep in mind uh, as you make a decision to buy a camera for your ministry. Other things, of course, this is common knowledge. Uh, higher megapixel means better quality. Uh, if you shoot with uh, uh, higher frames per second, you can you know, take action types of uh, shots and, uh, with, with your camera, if that's of importance. And some of the higher end cameras, of course, will will save images in a raw format as well as a JPEG format. The raw format allows you to further work with those images. Uh, you can do a lot more with that. So your the uh, DSLR and mirrorless cameras can give you both. So that's a big advantage of investing in that kind of a camera. OK. Um, all right, let's just talk a little bit about public address system. Uh, wait, let me pause and say uh, everybody's with me. You are with me so far? Okay. Okay, all right. 
Okay. Thank you. So, so we've talked about software. We've talked about cameras a little bit. Now let's talk about sound. Um, so, you know, when you are, when you are, you know, especially this is true about Sunday services. Okay. When you have an auditorium, a hall, like if you have, if you're sitting in a house and with you know 10, 15 people, you're not worried about, okay, can everybody hear me, etc. But when you're in an auditorium, then the whole issue of sound is very important because if you have an auditorium with you know a couple of hundred people sitting there and people cannot hear you, you may be preaching the best sermon or your worship team may be doing you know wonderful worship. But if the sound is not good inside the auditorium, people are going to, they're not going to be happy. They're going to be struggling to hear what you're saying or uh, they're going to be struggling to participate in the worship. So this is where uh, having a little knowledge about sound is, 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 is important. So that's one thing. The other thing is if the sound is too loud, it can be actually very painful. I remember uh, um, this was before the pandemic, of course. Uh, I visited a church. Uh, this was in the US. I went to, in a very, very famous church and all that. Okay, I said, okay, I'll go there. I'm visiting. Let me go in. I went in and I couldn't sit there. It, the sound was so loud. And, and I was telling my daughter, I said, oh, I can't even sit here. It is so, it is so painful. So, you know, I've, you've gone there to, uh, to worship God. For whatever reason, the sound was turned on so loud uh, that it was very, it was hurting, you know, the years. And uh, yeah, I, but I was a visitor, so I, you know, I, I had no say in any of this. But I'm just giving an example where it was so uncomfortable sitting inside that or, or that hall over there. I, I don't know who was, you know, maybe the people in charge didn't check you know of what how what the sound field was inside the auditorium and um, so anyway so you need to be aware of this that um, uh, if you are in an auditorium you need to tell your sound people to make sure you have a good sound field spread across the auditorium so if you look at this graphic, you can see that you know the sound just because you have uh, you know you've got your speaker set up on your stage and uh, across your auditorium doesn't mean the sound field is going to be uniform everywhere. Right? You can see by the shading of this, the red is okay, it's pretty good. Orange is pretty decent. Yellow and green is pretty like these sex, these people sitting here are going to find it difficult to listen. Right in these in these zones where it's yellow and green, and I will explain the decibel level. So typically, and then okay, so here's a better sound field, right? Yeah, and we'll talk about you know your audio equipment, of course. So if you have your audio equipment, so you can see that a larger portion of your audience is getting good sound, right? And it kind of veins, of course, as you go on the edges. So. Uh, you you know we we may need to address covering these zones with you know with speakers and so on, but a good portion of your 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 auditorium is well covered, and if your most of your congregation is going to be sitting in this area, fine, pretty decent, you know they've got it pretty good, right? So that's very important, and uh, additionally. You need to make sure that the sound levels are at, you know, at something that's comfortable, right? So typically, 65 dB, 65 decibels, is a good, decent sound, right? So you can just look at, you know, if you look at here, when you're about 30 dB, you're down here, it's like a whisper. People are not going to listen to you. You're not going to be able to hear you. Uh, if you're at 60 dB, that's decent. They can listen to you. Uh, if you get up above 85, uh, it's like the uh, motorcycle. It can be, 
you know, starting up, it can be uh, pretty loud. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, you didn't see my PDF. Oh, sorry, I'm so sorry. The PDF. Oh, I'm sorry about it. Uh, thanks for alerting me. Anyway, uh, you can see it now. Yes, but now it's okay, visible. Now it's, okay. This, so this is what I was talking. I thought all of everybody was seeing this. I'm so sorry. Anyway, I'll just quickly recap, and we'll pause. I think we're already out of time. So what I was saying is, so. You know, you've got your speaker set up here, and you know you can see the sound levels, how it's distributed inside the auditorium. It's not always uniform. Uh, you have places of red where it's good, orange is okay, yellow and green not good. Uh, if you you know you play with your sound system, you can have a better distribution of the sound. Uh, so centrally here, it's pretty good. And it veins off on the side, so these people sitting on the side will not be able to hear much, right? So you need to adjust it. So that's you know you need to work with your sound system to improve that. We'll talk about that later. And I was talking about this sound level here and this graphic. Uh, I'll just quickly recap, and we'll continue this next week. So what I was saying is, uh, when you're at this level, so when you're at 30 dB, it's whisper. Decent level talking audio around 60. Above 85 is like it's going to be a little, it's going to start hurting on the ears, right? So basically, if you can keep the dB level around 65 to maximum, don't push it beyond this, uh, it's a good, decent level. But you need to make sure the sound feel throughout your auditorium. That means in all, wherever you go, it's uniform and it's at, at about 65, between 65 to 80 dB, then it's a good level, right? And you can measure it in a very simple way. You can download this free uh, sound level meter. If you go, you know, you can download this app. Oh, there are a couple of other apps as well. Put on your phone and you just walk around. You tell somebody, hey, just walk around the auditorium, make sure that, you know, everywhere the dB level is good. So when you've, when you've got your sound, sound system turned up, you tell people to go around, and we do this regularly. Like even I think, a couple of Sundays ago, maybe two or three Sundays ago, we did a full check once again throughout our auditorium. Sound levels all good, everything is perfect. So then we are happy. People will come in and they'll be able to listen. Okay, uh, we'll continue this next Sunday. I'm sorry, I I was I forgot that. Uh, I mean, I didn't pay attention. I wasn't sharing the PDF. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, Abraham, CPAP application. Yes, Abraham, we will send it out maybe in a couple of weeks. Uh, we'll, we'll open it up. We'll send an email to all our Bible college students and invite them to uh, submit applications for their ministries so that we can, uh, you know, support the ministries. We will do that. Uh, we will do that. Uh, I think in April we'll do it before graduation. Okay. Okay. Um, any questions uh, so far? All right. Yeah. So if uh, if and if you're interested, you can download the sound meter, put it on your phone, just walk around your auditorium and see, you know, what the levels are, uh, just for fun. Okay. But generally, you want to keep it at a good level so that it doesn't hurt the people's ears, but it should be good enough for them to listen to the message or the worship so that they can participate and check at those points where. You know, uh, your 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 PA system may not be reaching well. You go and check the sound levels. Make sure it's good. Right? You can tell somebody to do it or multiple people to do it. And do it when everybody's in and all the people are inside the auditorium because everybody's in. Sound is being absorbed. Uh, so that's when you will feel the real effect that certain parts in your auditorium are not getting uh, sound. So then you know that you need to work on the PA system. Okay, we'll continue this next week. Uh, any, if there are no questions, we will close. Somebody could please pray and we will dismiss. Okay, I pray. 
We are grateful to you once again, Most High Lord, for your grace and your mercy that has ushered us through these moments of our days. Father, we pray, commit ourselves into your hands, O God, once more. Continue to guide us, continue to lead us, continue to be our teacher, and continue to be our counselor. We pray that whatever we have been instructed in this session, we will we'll be able to put into practical practice in our various ministries. That will be a blessing to us and to others. We bless you and we commend Pastor Ashes and the entire faculty to you, God. We pray that you continue to shower your grace and your blessings upon them. Father, be their guide and be their lead in Jesus' mighty name. We pray that continue yeah. to bless the entire department and entire class in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pastor. Have a good afternoon. God bless you. Bye now. God bless.